my name is Liz Lotus and I want to welcome everyone tonight to our inaugural culinary medicine. Basically what culinary medicine is a blending of art of food and cooking with the science of medicine and I think we probably need a nice pastime given the pressures of what's going on today and um, this is a sunflower from my garden so things are growing well this year. And um, so the American College of Preventive Medicine um, has launched a very large program on culinary medicine. And they actually have a fellowship that after 36 hours of CME, you can get certified in culinary medicine. And um, more flowers for my garden. <laughs> the next slide. They have come out with a culinary medicine curriculum. So if any of you are interested in recipes and techniques to use with your patients. This is gonna be available on the CMA Loop website and the um, address for this curriculum is included and I'll put it up on the chat, but it's also on this slide that I think Lynn and Lisa are gonna post at the end. Um, I'm really happy to see everyone. And so what I would like to do tonight, if possible, is through the PLA, we had sort of a support network that worked every two weeks. And we would start off with a meditation for a few minutes. And what I would ask everyone is to center yourself and think of something that sustains your soul and your body. And we'll just do some breathing for a couple of minutes just to get focused. So if you'll focus on breathing in and holding and releasing, and just try to let all the tension from today's work leave you. And if we could all come back together, thank you. Um, I want to introduce my co-host tonight, which is Chef Laura Robertson Boy. And she is um, a wonderful chef. And she and I have been working together for a few years now. And so as you saw from the menu, um, she's going to be demonstrating a tomato peach feta summer salad. And I'm going to turn it over to Laura now. Thank you, Dr. Lotus. Um, just a very quick little bit about myself. I, um, I'm a professionally tra trained chef, went to Johnson Wales University. I quickly learned that those who can't do teach, and I became a chef instructor uh, and taught at a culinary school. And I know a number of you from the work that I did over the last 10 years with Local Matters, which is a nonprofit organization that does healthful food education in central Ohio. Um, and along that journey, working with Local Matters, I got connected to students at the Ohio State University College of Medicine that really wanted to learn about healthful eating for themselves first, uh, and that was back in 2010. So we've been doing this for a decade now. Um, and then they started learning more about culinary medicine as a new approach to, again, not only eating healthfully for themselves, but also talking to their patients about diet and lifestyle choices as a way of preventing or treating um, chronic diseases related to diet. So we've been doing this work for a long time and you know everything comes down to nurturing the soul like we're talking about doing tonight um, through, through healthy eating. And so we, you know, we're here to dispel the notion that eating healthfully can't also be delicious. They can go hand in hand, right? So what, you know, what Liz and I conceived of for tonight was just a very simple cooking demonstration. And if you'd like to cook along with us, you are more than welcome to. If you just want to watch me cook uh, and practice on your own at home later, that's fine too. Did everybody get the recipe emailed ahead of time to them? Yes, you got the recipe so you can at least follow along maybe. Okay, I see a thumbs up from Kathy. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so 
um, bear with me because I haven't done a Zoom cooking class before. I'm used to doing all of my education hands-on, but we're living in this new world where we have to adapt to be safe. So uh, I'd love your feedback when we're done and see if this works because we're also talking about doing this kind of experience on a regular basis if you're interested. So we'll have a lot more discussion around that at the end. So to start with, uh, one of the very basic things, sort of lesson number one with cooking is to have all of your ingredients and all of your equipment in place. Uh, I'm going to put this French culinary term in the chat box. It's called mise en place, and it just translates into everything in its place. And it, so it's a chef term that we use to talk about getting all of your ingredients and all of your equipment together before you get ready to cook or make a recipe. I apply it to lots of things in my life. I always have to get my mise en place organized, even if it's just my grocery list to go to the store. So um, I will encourage folks to save questions for the end, but you're welcome to put things in the chat box. Dr. Lotus will be monitoring, and, and Lisa and Lynn are monitoring, monitoring the chat box, and then we can have more conversation when we're done. But I just wanted you to see the mise en place is all of the ingredients over here. We've got our fresh summer tomatoes from the garden, peaches from the farmer's market. Um, I have basil from my garden and then all of my equipment. So I've got my, the knives, the measuring spoons. I like to use a little scrap bowl for waste that I will then put in compost for the garden or it's just easier to carry things to the trash can if you want to put it in the trash all at one time instead of constantly going straight to the trash all the time. Uh, and then you probably can't see it in the back, but I've got my oils and vinegars, my salt, my pepper. So I've got everything at my disposal. And no, I don't cook like this all the time at home. <laughs> but we're doing this TV chef style, right? I will say that um, a few things about storing tomatoes and peaches. I always keep them out at room temperature. Never put them in the refrigerator because they get mealy and mushy and the texture and the flavor is far less desirable. So again, when things are in season and they're fresh, I always I'll always keep all my produce, well, my tomatoes and peaches stored out at room temperature on the counter. Okay, so I'm just gonna walk us through our recipe verbally. And again, I picked something quick and easy, no cook, because we don't have a lot of time together and we wanna make sure that we have time to have a conversation afterwards. Um, I'm going to start with a serrated knife. It's got the teeth on it, which is easier to cut a soft fleshed fruit. In this case, our tomatoes are fruit because it has seeds, right? So I'm going to start by coring the tomato with a serrated knife. Um, I'm going to hold, because tomatoes are round and they might roll around, you know, I try to hold things very carefully and stable with my opposite hand. And then I'm just going to cut this in slices through the middle. Again, a culinary term, it's called a composed salad. So instead of just a toss salad where everything goes into a bowl and you toss it together, we're going to present this in a composed fashion. So <laughs> putting them on a plate, right? So I'm, I'm going to transfer these over to my serving plate. And right now you can't see it, but you'll see the finished product uh, here in a minute after I'm done cutting and chopping. Okay, so a couple of tomatoes. I'm not doing this TV show style where I already had a bunch of stuff pre-prepped, right? <laughs> so we'll try to make it fast. Okay, I'm trying to think if there's some other things. So the basil, if you saw, I actually had it stored in a jar with no water, um, just out in the air. And basil is hard to, to store for long stretches of time. Um, so I usually just harvest it right before I'm going to make it uh, work with it in a recipe, I should say. Okay, peaches, I'm going to switch over to my paring knife, which is a small knife to do small work. And I'm just going to cut around the pit. A freestone peach, it just comes apart easily, whereas a clean peach, it that clings to the pit of the fruit, right? So I'm just going to cut these in wedges. They smell so delicious. Now, if we were in person, you could smell how great they smell. <laughs> All right, so I'm always, um, you know, trying to keep my guiding hand, my fingers out of the way so I don't cut myself. Is Kathy cooking along with me? She is. I can see it. Kathy, if you have questions as you go along, you can unmute yourself and ask, huh? Karen, are you cooking with me? 
I am. Did you um, did you peel the peach? I did not. Um, you can if you don't like the fuzz. I call myself a lazy chef, but really at the end of the day, it's also more nutritious if you keep the skins on. There's more vitamins and nutrients in the skin than there isn't, um, or than without if you take the skin off. So the lazy chef in me just keeps the skin on. The only problem is that peaches are one of the highest um, ranked uh, fruits for pesticides. So if your peaches aren't organic, you yes. probably don't want to leave the... And that's a very good point, Karen. So thank you for pointing that out. Um, you know, you can wash things, but you're never going to get rid of all the pesticides and whatnot on there. So yeah, so that's always a question. Um, you know, whether you choose to buy organic or conventional, and that's a choice that, you know, we always encourage folks to think about what they prefer to do on their own. As we know, at least for some people, if you're talking about talking to patients, and maybe they can't afford to make that choice between conventional versus um, organic food, right? But for yourself, you might make a different choice. Okay, so we have our sliced peaches. Those are gonna go in our salad uh, in a minute. And then I'm going to make, I'm going to do a fancy knife cut, which is called a chiffonade, which again is a French term that just means thin ribbons. Um, so I'm going to take my leaves of basil from the garden. And the easiest way to cut basil into ribbons is to stack the leaves on top of each other. I've already taken the tough stems out. Okay. And I'm going to roll them very tightly into a little roll like so. And then I'm, I'm actually going to use a large chef's knife for this job, even though it's a small thing that I'm cutting, because I want to use the wide heel of the chef's knife to do this task, okay? So I'm just going to push and pull and rock and slice my knife back and forth down that roll of um, basil to make thin ribbons, and that's called a chiffonade. So I tend to, when I'm using fresh basil in a recipe, I tend to chiffonade it. Um, it just looks prettier. Okay, and then uh, the last thing, I guess I'll, I'll compose my salad, and then the last thing is that we just put a dressing on it. So I need to do a little more cutting and chopping to make the dressing. So I am going to try to compose my salad here where you can see it. Here's another thing on my mise en place, a little chef's trick, is underneath my cutting board, you can put a wet paper towel, or I use just this, it's like a shelf liner, that grippy mat, so that your cutting board doesn't slide around on your counter while you're trying to cut and chop. So some, something to give friction when you're cutting and chopping is helpful. Okay, so we've got our tomato slices laid out. And I'm going to intersperse the peach slices in between the tomatoes so that it makes a, a nice visual presentation. It looks fancy. And it tastes delicious. Cooking in summer is so much easier, I think. Well, sometimes uh, because the food tastes so delicious on its own, you don't really have to do a whole lot to to make the food shine, right? You can just enjoy the flavor of the fresh peaches, the fresh tomatoes, because they just taste delicious straight off the vine. Okay, so we're composing our salad. If I weren't presenting this for all of you, I might stuff extra peaches in there just because they taste so good, <laughs> right? All right, and then we're going to put some fresh feta, well, not fresh, um, some feta cheese on this. If you don't like feta, you don't have to use it, or if, you're, um, if you don't eat dairy, it's not a necessary component, but it does give it sort of a nice sweet and savory balance. So you could use goat cheese in there, or no cheese at all. So we're just gonna sprinkle that a little bit on just for garnish, and then our chiffonade of basil. So it looks pretty, and it takes very little time to put it all together, right? Okay, then um, just a little bit of fresh ground pepper on the camera, just a little bit of that. 
a little bit of kosher salt. I'm not a big fan of using a lot of salt, but a little bit is a flavor enhancer. And again, if you're watching your salt or if your patients are watching, watching their salt, you don't have to use any at all. These things taste delicious as is, right? Okay, so I'm gonna move my salad back out of the way while we make our dressing. Get my mise en place set back up again. Um, I am going to move the extra food out of the way that I didn't use so I still have room to cook. And anytime you're moving your food across your cutting board using your knife, don't use the sharp side of your knife because uh, that'll dull your knife. So just flip it over to the back side to scrape, okay? All right, so the last thing is I'm going to mince some shallot to make our salad dressing. So if, if you haven't worked with shallots before, this is so weird, <laughs> trying to figure out how to do this. It's just, it's a small, sweet onion, right? Um, so again, you don't have to use onions if you don't like them. You can use a different kind of onion. If you don't have shallots, I did have to go out to the store today to buy a shallot because it's not something I always have on hand. Okay, I am going to use my paring knife to peel the shallot. So maybe we work over here, we can see a little bit. Just gonna trim off the top and the bottom. And then use the paring knife to peel the skin back, uh, maybe the top outer layer or two, the papery parts. Lisa, we're doing knife skills. <laughs> which Lisa wasn't sure about doing knife skills. But here we are. You can't cook without knife skills, huh? Laura, do you think there's much of a difference between using a shallot and like a green spring onion? You can absolutely do that. Let's see, that was Karen asking. Yeah, yeah, use what you have on hand, right? And the green spring onions are still very mild in flavor, right? So yes, you could use that. You could use red onions, which look pretty, but they've got a pretty strong flavor when they're raw. And talking about, you know, the healthfulness or not of foods, I was pretty surprised that um, if you saw the FDA said that there was a whole massive amount of E. coli linked to onions last week. Did you see that? I threw out all my onions, because they said if you didn't know the source, throw out your onions because it's not safe. But what I know as a chef is that if you cook your food, it kills the E. coli bacteria. So I'm like, do I really have to throw out my onions if I'm cooking with them? But using them raw in a salad, yes, right? Okay, and that's why I had to go to the store to put a shallot today. I threw out my onions last week. I just peeled off just a, a let's see, a, just a simple papery layer on the outside and that's it. Okay. Okay, I am going to use my large chef's knife again to mince the shallot. So I'm gonna start by putting the root end away from my body, so it should be facing towards the camera. Again, I'm gonna use this claw shape with my fingers to hold the onion safely, the shallot safely, and I'm gonna use just the front part of my knife to make thin slits. I think I should sharpen my knives. <laughs> this one's pretty dull. Um, I'm gonna make thin slits that don't go quite all the way through the end of the onion. And I'm moving my fingers out of the way if I'm worried I'm gonna cut myself. I always tell everybody you don't have to cut onions quickly like TV chefs, you wanna keep your fingers intact. I'm gonna turn it 90 degrees with the root end over here away from my knife. And again, use my claw to hold the onion together while I just make straight slices that go all the way down. And it'll fall apart into a dice. We only need a tablespoon, so we don't even need all of this. These are still pretty large, so if we want to make them smaller because our recipe says to mince, you do that by putting your guiding hand on top of the end of the knife at the tip and using the heel of the blade to just chop through the whole pile of onions until it's broken down in pretty small pieces, and that's mincing. And those are our knife skills. We can do it safely, Lisa, right? <laughs> Maybe. I feel much better when I'm walking around a classroom and watching everybody use their knives than trusting you to do it all safely at home. <laughs>
One of the videos that we're talking about putting on this site would be um, one of the, actually she's a resident at Riverside demonstrating knife skills, so we'll have it in the library posted it on the site. Yes. And she learned how to cut onions from the best, huh? <laughs> yes. Not to toot my own horn. The students are so attentive. They're amazing. Okay, um, we're going to make a salad dressing. And again, I'm going to do this quick and easy. I love to make salad dressings in a little mason jar because um, it's just quicker and easier than getting out extra equipment. And when I'm done, I can store it in the refrigerator like this, any extra. So it sort of does double duty, right? The recipe says a tablespoon. I will admit I rarely ever measure. But for the purposes of this, this class, we'll measure. The onions are making me cry. This is the benefit to having a Zoom meeting. Because <laughs> you're not crying watching me cut onions. That's a good thing. Okay, and then our salad dressing is, you know, I never buy salad dressings in the grocery store because I spend more time looking at the ingredient list to try to make sure that I'm avoiding all the things that I shouldn't be eating in my salad dressing. Right, Karen? I know you're smiling. <laughs> and there's so much added sugar or high fructose corn syrup or way too much sodium or all these things that you don't need, right? And, um, or that you shouldn't be eating for health. So all I need is a good quality olive oil or there's some other flavorful kind of oil, some kind of vinegar. And that's the basics of uh, basic vinaigrette is just, um, three parts oil to one part vinegar. So you'll see that in our recipe here where we're, it says three tablespoons olive oil to one tablespoon of balsamic vinegar. And then if you want to add other things for flavor like our shallots, and we're gonna sweeten, sweeten it with a little bit of honey because we're putting this over sort of a sweet salad with the peaches, um, you can then embellish from there, right? So we're just gonna do three tablespoons of olive oil and one tablespoon of balsamic vinegar. So if you keep a well-stocked pantry with oils and vinegars, you never need to go to the grocery store and look for a salad dressing. Unless you just really like ranch, right? Which you can also make that homemade. <laughs> Wait, honey, that took me all the way to the top of my four ounce jar. Okay, and that's it. So I don't need all this dressing for that tiny little salad that I just made, right? So again, you can just um, use the extras, leave them in the fridge and use them until they're done. So a simple vinaigrette like this will last in the refrigerator for weeks. Uh, okay, maybe not because it's got onions in it. And so then let me, all we have to do is just press the salad and we're done. Then we get to eat if you were to have made it along with me. It's that simple and easy. Um, your peaches will start to oxidize or turn brown or break down over time. So this is one of those kinds of things that you want to make right as you're going to serve it and not plan to have leftovers, right? So this recipe says it makes about four servings. Um, my family of four would probably eat all this in one meal. And if you're making it for a crowd, well, we don't go to picnics and parties anymore, do we? You would just make more. You would double it or whatever. So that's my summer salad of tomatoes, peaches, and feta. And if you have questions now, I'm happy to answer questions, or we can keep on going with our conversation that Dr. Lotus is going to lead for us, right? But yeah, does anyone have any questions about any of the skills that I demonstrated? Uh, Mark? So a question, I was offline uh, when you were saying this, and I heard just the tail end. But can you tell me about E. coli and onions and what we need to be concerned about? Yes. Okay. And Lisa has a question too in the chat box. Okay. So uh, E. coli, you know, um, it can be transmitted obviously right through food if it's not cooked properly. So the FDA recommended that you just throw all onions out last week, which I thought was a little extreme. Um, if you're going to use raw onions and you don't know the source that they came from, yes, you probably should throw them out because when in doubt, throw them out is the chef's rules. So if you're not sure. But cooking food to 165 degrees or more kills the E. coli bacteria. So if you're using onions in a sauce or a, you know something where you're cooking it, it, and you cook it long enough that it gets to that 165 degrees, it should kill the, the bacteria and you should be fine. 
So I had a hard time throwing my onions out last week because I use them in everything. And as long as I'm cooking them, I know that they should be safe to eat, right? Right. But I, I guess I, I was wondering if there was a certain area from which we needed to be more concerned about onions. Um, I hadn't been aware that that was a source of E. coli. So this one was for California, mid and Southern California production of red onions, but not many places put that on their red onions and it's hard to track down where in the country they came from. The outbreak was confined to California, but we get onions from Mexico, California, Florida. So to be on the safe side, I think is why they said, just get rid of all your onions. I think it was a safety thing. I thought it was supposed to be from some kind of a brand called Thomas. Thompson. Which I have, yeah, I have no Thompson. idea what that is. Is, is that what you said, Dr. Alperi? Thompson. Thomas? I thought it's Thompson, and it was sold mainly here from the store I read. It's Kroger, the main one. So yes, yeah. Not I, much. They added yellow and uh, white onion to the red onions after they said only red onions. So they did. I they just they added it. all the onions. It, it was in Ohio. It was Kroger's. Yeah, so I do, in the summertime, I do get more produce from farmer's markets. And so I just decided I was just getting my onions from local farmers um, because then you know that they're probably being produced more safely. So, but yeah, that's a really good question, right? Uh, because you don't wanna mess around with foodborne illness. So other questions? Thank you. Yeah. Well, that was easy. But yeah, I didn't realize I was going to introduce <laughs> talking about E. coli and our nourishing the soul and body. I mean, it's such a scientific part of things, right? That you have to think about everything. Karen, are you sampling your salad? And she's on, you're on mute. How does it taste? <laughs> it looks like she's enjoying it. Martha, you're muted. Sure. It's wonderful. And the onions are from my garden, so I think they're safe. That's fantastic. Wow. Kathy, did you finish your salad? Yeah, it looks great. You haven't tried it yet. Anita, are you making your salad? Yes? He's making dinner. <laughs> oh, that sounds better. <laughs> we had a comment from Dr. Zach because there was a question about vegan feta, and he suggests BioLife as a, and it's also got some oil and sodium in it, but it's probably the best for avoiding dairy and animal products. Sure, or you can just leave it out. It's not a necessary part. Yeah, and Lisa, I'm sorry, you had a question in the chat. I and mean, here I am busy answering questions in person. Um, but, uh, I was just curious because I've heard different things about like recommendations on where to buy produce locally if you weren't able to make it to a farmer's market. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, by, even buying from farmer's markets this season is hard, right? Um, I ended up subscribing in the springtime, and so I don't think it's something you can add to now, but there may be others that do. To I ended up subscribing to a community-supported agriculture, which the acronym is CSA. Um, there are some, and actually, again, to Karen's point, if you want to go all organic, there is just one all organic CSA that serves Central Ohio, and it is called uh, the acronym is GROW, Great River Organics. They may be taking new subscriptions. You get a weekly market bag of things at the farm. farm the, um, there is a co-op of farms, so it's not just one farm. Um, you get a weekly bag of things that each of the farms are growing seasonally, which is kind of nice. So Great River Organics would be the only all organic CSA. So that's one way you can get your produce without going to a farmer's market. The one that I use, I love because they drop it straight to my doorstep. So it's all completely contactless. I love that. Um, so I subscribed to that when we were all locked in for COVID, right? Um, I, other places, it's hard. It's actually very hard. When I started this, the work with the Local Matters organization 10 years ago, everybody was in the local food movement and locavores and all that kind of stuff. So there were a lot of sources. And to be honest, places like Walmart and Kroger started saying that they were carrying local foods and it kind of put the small local businesses out of business. So it's actually, I think it's harder to find locally sourced foods now, which is sad. Yeah. Um, but that's a trend I've seen over the last decade is that it, there was this big excitement and push to, for everybody to buy local foods and the available sources and then diminished because they've been pushed out by the big giant retailers, which is sad because those aren't local, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. It, it gets hard to seek that kind of thing out. So you can place orders with the Clintonville Farmers Market. It's not in person anymore, but you can do pickup. And some of their providers guarantee organic. That's great. And so I, I want to make sure that we have time for your conversation, Dr. Lotus, because I just looked at the time and it's not quite 20 till. So I'll turn it back over to you. So thank you, Laura. Um, and really, I just want to open this up for a discussion of what people think and what you would like going forward. One of the thoughts that we had had um, before this came about was putting up a recipe line where we would have recipes stored on this site. Um, um, so that was one of the things um, we are going to try to incorporate on a, a regular basis. And um, basically, we just want to have a conversation of what you all think. What do you think would serve this community? Um, I guess, first of all, I'm Zach Carmosis, everybody. Sorry for this is my first time being here. Hi, Zach. Um, nice to meet you all. Um, focusing on, I know that Lisa asked in the, in the comment section about a, a vegan option, the reason why I, I think one of the things we should focus on is whole food plant-based medicine. This is a great recipe. The only thing that's not the way that you know, there's some whole food plant-based is, is the feta cheese. Um, so focusing on that, looking at disease prevention, disease reversal, and trying to primarily knock these things out before they even show up by advocating diets rather than meds. If you've got somebody who's borderline diabetic or borderline blood pressure cholesterol, you can change their diet and reduce a ton of the stuff before even starting meds, before even starting anything even close to that. Um, so uh, I know, I think um, the Mount Carmel residents were looking at doing some whole food plant-based education, which is awesome. Um, so kind of continuing along that line is something that I really would love to see. So um, Lisa Hamilton does the internal medicine, um, culinary medicine program, and she uses the Dr. Harlan uh, Health Meets Food curriculum. And definitely, um, I think that that is a direction that we should really look at. Um, as physicians, we're kind of behind more of our residents are getting trained in this than we ever got trained. So we're kind of playing catch up, but um, I think those are really great suggestions and thank you. What is your specialty, Zach? So I'm an actually an ER doc. Um, okay. So my wife does primary care outpatient medicine, but um, a pretty strong focus in diet. I even try to talk to some of my patients in the ER about this as often as I can when they come in blood borderline blood pressures, which is difficult. Um, but yeah, our, our focus is I try to at least incorporate some of this into ours. We've been practicing this for you know four or five years ourselves, um, and the, the literature is not subtle, and, it, and that's why we kind of love talking to our patients about it. That's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Kathy, did you have a question or a comment? Uh, just a comment. I thought um, your presentation was great. It was easy to follow. I kept up and so forth. I like the idea of connecting, um, you know, the families, the medical families together and proving that you can do this in a matter of time together and it just builds a relationship and you, you stop thinking about what your day was like and, and you just have conversation around it. And so I think anytime we can kind of, you know, move in that direction really helps the medical family. Great. Thank you for that feedback. So are all the classes going to be toward the uh, professional, health professional, or it's going to be toward patients and their families? I'm just wondering what's the plan here. So that's kind of what we're trying to query and find out from y'all tonight. Um, do you want it a blend of physicians? Do you want it a blend of what physicians can do for their patients? Or, you know, it's up to you all how this evolves, I guess is what I'm saying. So what would meet your needs? Are you, Lisa, are you going to put these on the blog? Like, because I think we're trying to attract everybody on the CMA blog, right? Yep. And yeah, so there's a community being put together just like the women in medicine community um, with um, a work group led by Dr. Lotus. Mm -hmm. And you know, again, introducing feedback and, and people that want to participate. There's a poll that we can launch as soon as um, we decide to today on this group, but it also can be put in that community so we can get a broader feedback. Liz, I think it'd be nice if we had um, the, you know, a little bit of a blend, but if there was even just like a recipe occasionally that we could um, 
easily print off and that might be available to give to patients, that would be nice. Yeah, so what, um, what I had thought about, and I think this would be helpful if, if we had a, a library of recipes for patients and a library for physicians or maybe both um, and have them posted on this community group that we're creating. So um, particularly for OBs, um, with you all dealing with your hypertension and your diabetes, um, and also internal medicine, but you know, trying to reach out to the different areas that everyone faces in their practice. Thank you. I think one hour is very reasonable. Many people probably can participate if they know it's, uh, the length is not too long. At the same time, if we can concentrate on two or three pearls every class, I think without overwhelming people, they can enjoy the conversation and probably cooking and learning at the same time. Thank you, Dr. Curry. Thank you. And I think Catherine shared another source for um, local foods, which is Yellow Bird Food Shed, uh, which they also do a CSA subscription. Um, I think you have to pick those up at different designated locations around town, if I'm not mistaken. Pick up or you can pay a little extra for delivery and it's totally worth it and all Ohio farmers. That's great. Thank you, Catherine. I think the butcher grocer in Grandview also has um, local Ohio grocery providers. Yeah, I know they, um, in fact, there was just an article on them today or yesterday in the paper. Um, they've opened another restaurant um, and I know their sausage and meats are locally sourced. So we can, we can definitely include information like that as far as food delivery services, organic and um, butchers. Zach, I have a question for you. Um, is, are you st is the, do, there's like vegan and organic wines. Do they count when you're following your diet? Can you drink those? You know so, there's so I, I, I don't pay much attention to the vegan wines because the reason that they're not vegan is because of the skins that they're made. And I think the actual animal product contamination is probably pretty low. Um, but I, there are some people who are very strict about that, and I couldn't even tell you honestly where to find vegan wines. Yeah, you'd probably have to go to some kind of special Whole Foods, I said Whole Foods, special <laughs> natural food store, which could include Whole Foods. Yes. Interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> I thought all specific. wines are vegan. Where the dairy products sit in the wine? Is there dairy product in it or animal? products in wine? It has to do with the way they ferment the wine. I think it's the case in which they ferment it. It's like some animal-based lining along it. It's not actually the wine itself. It's the container in which they ferment it, oh. um, is my understanding. It's, yeah, it gets very specific, huh? <laughs> so it depends on how specific a vegan you are. Right. I guess. Or if you're just vegetarian, right? Yeah, if you're vegetarian, it's easy. But I guess for you know, ethical vegans, I think have a harder time with that than um, nutritional vegans. Right, that's so specific. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Lotus, would you like me to share the screen of the community? Yes. Um, it, it's a work in progress as soon as I get a few things uh, figured out. But this is on our website. There's, um, the CMA Loop is our main community where all CMA members can participate. We have a women, women in medicine community that's being chaired by uh, Dr. Samani, that there's a lot of fun and cool things going on there, like about to be launched as well. And then this culinary medicine group, which is going to include not only a library of like the recipes that Dr. Lotus mentioned that can be contributed, resources, etc., but also um, discussion posts that will, you know, there's none listed here because there hasn't, this hasn't been launched yet, but that's where you can put, you know, I'm looking for questions about vegan wine per se or something and, and Dr. Zach can respond to that. Um, events as um, Dr. Lotus's group plans out the year based on feedback from our um, physicians. You know, we can, we can plot these out throughout the year so people can mark them on their calendar. And if you're all okay with it, 
everyone on this call, I'll go ahead and add to this group because, you know, we don't typically force people into a uh, special interest group. But if you're all fine, just based on uh, there is a way to do it where I can just go ahead and add everybody to this group. And as it's being developed, you'll see it progress. And then you can share it with your colleagues and friends and say, hey, do you want to be part of this, et cetera. And there is a larger group that Laura heads up, uh, Chef Laura heads up, Central Ohio Health Meets Food Organization, and it includes physicians, um, dietitians, instructors from Columbus State, the culinary instructor there, medical students, um, Southeast Mental, there's a nurse practitioner involved. Um, and so some of them have volunteered to, to do also do demonstrations um, or just discussions. Uh, Rosemary is, is a wonderful dietitian um, and she's very involved in culinary medicine. So there's a wealth of resources in our community and it would be really nice to hook physicians up with this group and get them involved um, and help out also. So Laura doesn't have to shoulder the burden all the time. <laughs> but um, uh, Lisa has a, uh, survey that she would like you all to fill out um, at the end tonight and it just basically would let us know what would work for you in the future and we really appreciate um, your filling that out. Um, any last comments by anyone? I thought it was great. Good job everybody and thank you for, for putting this on. It was a really well done. Thank you. Thank you. Delightful. Thank you. Look forward to it in the future. Thanks, Karen. Great, great job, Laura, for your first cooking class on Zoom. It was awesome. <laughs> we kept all our fingers intact. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. It all looks great. I appreciate everybody being here. Yes, thank you, everyone. Nice to everyone. Stay safe, stay healthy. Till we cook again. <laughs>